Once again, we come to that blessed time where we take up God's word and consider it together. I'm gonna ask you to please stand as I open it to Romans chapter 12 as we prepare this morning to consider the depths and the riches of Romans chapter 12, verse two. I'm gonna begin reading in verse one. And I'm going to read down through verse 8 and then pray. Listen as I read God's word. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For the grace given me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so though many are one body, in Christ and individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheer- cheerfulness. Let's pray. Lord God, I truly request of you this morning that you would be pleased to meet us and attend to your word preached. God, give everyone that you've brought here this morning ears to hear. Lord, as we open up and consider your word, we consider the word of God, the word of truth, that which is necessary for our correction and our instruction, and we pray, O God, that it would have that effect this morning. Lord, grant for me to speak clearly. Give us a hunger an eagerness, an attentiveness to your word. Grant us, O Lord, that we can overcome the weakness and weariness and distractions of the flesh and this world and attend to what your word says. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Please be seated. As we take up this morning, Romans 11, or Romans 12, verse 2, we're going to unpack that verse, but one of, when we begin to do so, there is a lot in just this one verse, in its pertinence, in its power, in its practicality for us to consider together this morning. I've actually titled this message, you can see that if you have the notes or outline, Radically Reformed. And someone says that's an interesting title for uh, Romans 12 verse 2. Well, uh, again, radically means thoroughly or fundamentally or completely, and the word reformed means having been changed in such a way as to be improved or better. Our hope and heart's desire is that, at, and the Word of God accomplishes this, that at the basic fundamental level of who we are, and how we think we have been changed and are being changed by the Spirit and the Word for better. The the same thing that with regard to the Reformation or whatever, with regard to church. Church needs to continually say, are we doing the things that God has shown are most pleasing to Him? Individually, we must ask, am I doing the things that are most pleasing to him? Again, listen as I read Romans 12, 2 and hear it. I'll read it again at the end, and I'm hoping by the end, uh, the sense of it has so expanded and broadened and deepened that we get the, the weight and depth of this verse. 
do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your minds, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now as we begin to take this up, I, I look at this and think, how important are these words in every generation, but how pertinent they are specifically in the circumstances we see in the world around us? I mean, we, we've lived through a, a peculiar season in the history of the world, have we not? Some sort of global pandemic with all kinds of different opinions and ideas and approaches and things that we can't figure out. Is that scientific? Is that political? What's going on? You know, it, it's, it's led to a degree of doubt and a degree of confusion with regard to the world. And in the midst of that, there have been other things beginning to be poured out upon the world that are further confusing. You know, there is the absolutely, absolute creation of new pronouns. I mean, zur and zem. Per. I mean, what, what are you talking about? These are just weird, made up sounds that somebody has decided, this is now what you will call me, zur. You know, uh, you know it sounds mildly science fiction. You know, it do, you know, but we've lived through things where we thought, this looks a lot like 1984 by George Orwell, some have said. But I've also been looking this week in consideration of this thought of not being conformed to the world and been reminded of yet another book or two that was written by Lewis Carroll. Not that we're forming a book club and not that I'm endorsing these books per se, but there is an exchange between Alice, who is uh, from Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass, and, and Humpty Dumpty, one of your favorite and familiar characters. But listen to this exchange. Alice says to him, I don't know what you mean by glory, Alice said. Humpty Dumpty smiled contemptuously. Of course you don't until I tell you. I meant there's a nice knockdown argument for you. But glory doesn't mean a nice knockdown argument, Alice objected. When I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, nothing more nor less. Whoa. <laughs> the question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be master? That's all. Ooh. I mean, this is very interesting because we curiously live in a world in which words that have been known since the beginning of time I mean, since the Garden of Eden, when God created man and woman, male and female created he them. I mean, this was before anyone else existed. And pretty much in every generation and every century before you reach the great wisdom of our age, you could ask this simple question, which was recently asked to a Supreme Court nominee, what is a woman? What is a woman? To which now we live in a world where basic words and basic ideas, well, I can't answer that. Uh, I'm not a biologist. Well, uh, thank you for noting the answer to that is rooted in biology. If only everybody, and you don't have to be a detailed biologist, to know those things. Like, you don't have to be a detailed botanist to look at something and say, that's a plant, not an animal. 
I mean, I, we can get that far <laughs> with, with a degree of knowledge, but all these things begin to get uh, further, more fallen, and more confused. And, and what I find interesting is the statement was further stated to Alice at another occasion. These words, I am not strange, weird, off, nor crazy. My reality is just different from yours. It's like, what? You know, was this man a prophet? It's, you know, it has that sense. And, and then one last thing that, I, that he says, says uh, in, in Alice in Wonderland, before we really look to unpack the scriptures pertaining this, he says this, imagination is the only weapon in a war against reality. And I mean, it's like, okay, we've abandoned reality, and now whatever people think, and so, so individuals, and, it's, and there's increasing curiosity as time unfolds between people identifying uh, in confused human manners to where there's now mild influences of animals, I, I saw someone recently who says, you know, I identify as nine non-binary with a bit of feline. Like, what? <laughs> Do not be conformed to this world. We are not to get our information and our definitions and our ideas by the world because the world is regularly adrift. Amen. And they may set up rules and try to legislate morality and say this is right, this is wrong, this is illegal, this is not illegal. But men have not the right to sanction the murder of unborn children. Amen. They don't. Ever, anywhere, no mother has that right. No one has those. But people assert those freedoms and those choices. And the scary thought is, little by little, piece by piece, the church capitulates. And by the church, I mean more broadly, not this church uh, and, and not many churches. There are many faithful churches out there, but there are also far too many who are capitulating, and as they compromise, people will look at us and say, well, you're Christians, they're Christians, and they're doing it. You're Christians, they're Christians, and they're welcoming it. They're approving it. They're endorsing it. And what I'm saying is our approval, our, our endorsing, means absolutely nothing. The question is, does God approve it? Does God endorse it? That's what we have to come to, the clear answer. And, and I will tell you this, the scriptures unpack these things in ways that are not to be confused. Some will say, well, Jesus never said this and Jesus never said that, and I fear they've never read the Scriptures. Because it's easy to say Jesus never said if you've got no clue what Jesus said. I mean, I say, for example, in Matthew, when being questioned about the issue of divorce and men and women who were in marriage, Jesus said in Matthew 19.4, he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female. This is Jesus talking about the creation, order, and design by God. In the context of the world, you know what you got? Male and female. In the context of marriage, you know what you got? Male and female. You know, it, why would somebody want to start trying to do some sort of a, a peculiar fractal calculus when you got simple math? 
You know, one plus one. Why are you trying to confuse what is actually very, very clear and simple? And Jesus says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. A man leaves. He holds fast to his wife. The two become one flesh. They are no longer uh, two but one. What therefore God has joined together, let no one separate. Amen? But see, we, and I, I fear this, we live in a world in which we're looking at some of the compromises around us and bemoaning it, but there's been so many compromises before. We have had a tendency, and I understand it because of the peculiar, extreme expressions of sin in the age in which we live, but we've become tolerant of things that are not pleasing to God that we put kind of at the lower level, you know? And note, all of those things God forgives, but don't, let's not think that because God forgives us of those sins, that they weren't sins, that they weren't wrong, and they ought not be willingly a part of who we are and what we are. We don't conform to this age or this culture. The scripture says things like this, 1 Corinthians 6 9 through 11, listen what it says. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, that gives no, none of us grounds for boasting, does it? Because none is righteous, no, not one. So our only hope is the forgiveness and the righteousness that is ours by faith in Jesus Christ. So this doesn't give anyone grounds for boasting, but it seeks to help understand some of the practical expressions of unrighteousness and, and give a little wake-up call to those who think, I'm fine, when you're not, says this. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. And I read that list and many of us say, ah, you can't, such were some of us. We indeed were. And even if you weren't on that list, if he had sought to be more comprehensive in the expressions of sin and unrighteousness, you'd have been on there. But I'm doubtful you escaped the greedy, revilers. Because sometimes it was uh, just, you know, constantly speaking ill of and negative. That, that's not a big deal. You know, and you look at these and say, well, it, it says drunkards or drunkenness but the law is actually not to drink and drive and drunk in public there's no law against uh, being in your own home or in your backyard uh, there's no law in our country against that but is it still wrong in the eyes of God yes and so what we've got to understand is God gives us and reveals the unchanging standards by which we think and live. We are not to be conformed to this world. He goes, I simply want to remind you of this before we even begin to unpack it more deeply. Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 7 says so wonderfully a little spot of wisdom we would do well to take into our hearts and minds it says this trust in the lord with all your heart now you know what it's not saying trust in your government which even if i were to tell you that i know you'd be struggling right or or trust no trust in no you know what it else doesn't say Trust yourself. Doesn't say trust your heart. It doesn't say trust your mind. It says trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. So it isn't just for me to sit back and say, oh, the world's doing this and I think. Well, I think. Who cares? 
I mean, it, I mean, there might be one or two people in the world who would even care what I think, you know, and they're wrong to do so, <laughs> you know. What matters is what God has revealed. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge Him. That, uh, acknowledge Him isn't a, yeah, He's there. Yeah, he's there. No, no, no. It is in all your ways, yada. In all your ways, know him. A present and real awareness and experience of him is to be a part of all of our ways. And he will direct or make your path straight. Then it goes on in verse 7 to remind us of kind of what it said before in case we missed, lean not on your own understanding. It says, be not wise. In your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Well, who, divine, who defines evil that we're to turn away from? God does. That's why it said, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. When we begin to understand these things, it is so important. When the scriptures begin to unpack things, it says of those who are supposed to in the future, uh, uh, or, or supposed to be church leaders and church teachers. Let me, let me back up for a second. 1 Timothy 1, 9, and 10 says this. I'm going to read a lot of scripture today. I'm hoping you can take it all in. But there's so much truth from God's word to unpack. And I want to focus today on very little of my thoughts and my opinions and lay a lot of God's word out for us. It says this in 1 Timothy, uh, partway through verse 9 of chapter 1. The ungodly and sinners, the unholy and profane, for the, uh, speaking of, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and then it goes, whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. Wait a second, so you're saying morality is a doctrinal issue? Yes, it is! It is what is taught by God. Goes on to say with regard to those who are to be leaders in the church. To, Paul says to Titus in Titus 2.1, 2, As for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. So if somebody who is presently a practicing serial killer wants to be baptized and join the church, we're going to decline that in, uh, application. If somebody who is presently unmarried, but living in physical immorality with a, with a significant other, we are going to decline that application. If, if, if someone is confused as to thinking that there's nothing wrong with who I love, love is love, love wins, and all this other nonsense... The fact is, the scriptures say, those who practice homosexuality, it's contrary to sound doctrine, they will not be permitted in. Those who are to be elders should teach what accords with sound doctrine. When they do not do so, they don't actually move the markers of what is permissible to God. Those are immovable markers. What they've done is declared themselves outside the counsel of God. They've declared their way and their church contrary to sound doctrine. I mean, I wish they would just say it in those words. From now on, we are not committed to sound doctrine. And I'm scared that most of the people might stay. I would hope not if they said it that blatantly. But I feel like it's just a smidge less blatant. You know, if, if you're listening and your mind's open and you're aware, you should hear it. Titus 1.9, he says, of, again, of the leaders in the church, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. Not as he feels, but as it has been taught in Scripture and then faithfully taught from Scripture so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine, listen, and rebuke those who contradict it. 
I think rebuke would be unloving, therefore it's inconsistent with Christianity and shouldn't ha- take place in the churches. We should just love and accept everybody. Is that what it says? No, the instruction of God's word says not only to teach sound doctrine, but to rebuke when it's not. When it's not to, to not him and haw and carefully, well, some people think, you know, no, no, no. It is wrong. This is sin. Repent and turn from it. Oh, the word of God is so powerfully clear. And, I, and again, sometimes it's in simple ways. I remember years ago being asked this question, and it's even stirring up again. Oh, what about women pastors? Well, let me read for you the word of God. It says in 1 Timothy 2, 12 and following, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. She is to remain quiet, for Adam was formed first, and then Eve. Now I ask you, in what century or generation is that fact going to change? Adam was formed first, and then Eve. That's an unchanging creation reality. And then the second thing he says there, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. That is a historic reality, something that happened historically that will not change. And say, someone says, well, uh, I don't think that's fair. Again, some people have said they don't think it's fair that Adam's sin and condemnation will be passed on everybody. Don't lean on your own understanding. Don't follow your own heart. What God says is right and true. Maybe some of you would, would be upset that uh, because of Eve's compromise and sin, her pain would be greatly increased in childbearing. Despite what the world's telling you, that does not happen to men. Okay? Men don't bear children, and nor is their pain necessarily increased unless, you know, they're somehow so connected and intimately and they see the suffering and hold their breath accidentally till they pass out. But generally speaking, uh, so the scriptures are clear. And what, 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 what a young lady was asking me about this passage, she said, uh, I, I said, which part of this verse don't you understand? I mean, what, which words are confusing in there? I do not permit. Huh. Well, th- 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 many people say, oh, no, 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 no. Let's just stop right there. With, you're going to the many people say. Why are you going to the many people say? You know, many people say lots of crazy things. I mean, have you not listened to this world? I mean, some people will say whatever they see on a teleprompter. Boom, 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 whatever's there, just repeat. God help us to not just reiterate what others say, what others think, and what others write, but let us learn to say, let this, God's word, in a sense, be my teleprompter. I will say what it says, and I will repeat it. And the nice thing about it is, unlike everything else, you might be repeating what is false. Here you're repeating what is true. There you might be repeating something a lot of people will agree with. Here you might be repeating something that really bothers a lot of people. But it's God's word. This is, as we see from our outline here, a prohibitive command. Do not be conformed. The origin of this particular word for do not be conformed uh, has the sense of a mold in which you would pour something into that mold that was hot or molten and what would happen to what you pour into the mold? It takes on the shape of of that mold and here it says do not be conformed to the world or this present age we don't simply take on that form but I I want to say this as, as a simple thought and a reminder that we ought not miss because sometimes we get confused and we think okay not conforming to the world today 
um, means dressing like Little House on the Prairie. Well, which I'm not saying is bad. I, I appreciate the modesty of that particular season. But, but note this. That was how the world dressed, even who didn't know the Lord, you know, in the 1800s and 1900s. So you can't simply say, well, I'm not going to be conformed to the world of 2020. I'm choosing to be conformed to the world of, and then choose a year. That's not the answer, and that's not the way. To sin, because every season in man's history has had its own expressions of sin. And we've seen that so many other places. The only other verse where this word for do not be conformed is used in the entirety of the New Testament is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14. Listen as I read. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions, desires, lusts of your former ignorance. That's a scary thought, isn't it? I don't think the world will like that. I used to think like you when I was ignorant. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you. Uh, but the scriptures say that uh, unashamedly and want us to recognize when we rested in our own hearts and thoughts and inclinations, we were ignorant. Ignorant of truth, ignorant of God's way, ignorant of God's design. What a shock in a world that, uh, 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 I guess soon the pledge will not be said in schools. One nation under God. If it's under God, then it ought not it be in God's design? In God's order? But see, we live in a godless society where they've tried to have this separation of church and state that results in an anti-God view of government and education. And in that view, it ends up learning what is but speculative ignorance. And time will tell that, and again, some of us don't know that, some of us do, but I tell you one of the areas of my own peculiar interest is astronomy, and it's thrilling to see uh, how month after month after month they say, we have new data from this or new data from that, and many scientists are having to rethink our models on the origins of the cosmos, you know? And we have this data. Uh, it proves what, we, what everyone held before to be impossible. Which means we were ignorant of these details that cancel that out. And so then they create other models. And then more details cancel that out. The model they can't tolerate is the one that says, you know how everything came to be? It was created by a holy, eternal wise, unchangeable God. Wait, that seems to account for everything. <laughs> yes, it does. But the fool denies that God exists. And so he goes on to say here, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Uh, again, the King James says it there, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts of ignorance. But as he who calls you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Hmm. So let me think about what I think is the holy approach to this kind of morality and what I think is holy with regard to marriage. Do I define that? No. No. Since it is written, again, I like it, you shall be holy for I am holy. What is the standard for my holy conduct and my holy perspective? God himself and what God has revealed. If you call him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds. Hold on a second. Are you saying that 
everybody ultimately is going to be judged by God and by God's standard? Oh, uh, yeah. But what if they were rigidly faithful to the standards of men? You know, I, I think that, that's, it, it, that's so hilarious. You know, that's like um, having a hurdle race, but the hurdle is just a broomstick laying on the ground. You know, and you just set a new record for the hurdles. No, you didn't. For you to have set a record, the hurdle needs to be of a particular fixed height, and you need to get yourself over that. You know, if you drop it to the ground, almost, almost any of us here could hurdle it. I don't know if everybody can. But, but the world is, keeps pushing morality down, doesn't it? To where suddenly everyone is an elite hurdling athlete. No, they're not. No, I'm not. <laughs> and so the standard has to be clear and unchanging because it says in verse 18 of 1 Peter 1, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways. King James there says vain conversations, but conversation makes us feel like talking. It's more than talking. It's the way you think and the way that you conduct yourself. You were ransomed from that. This is a powerfully prohibitive statement. Jesus says this in John 15, 19. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. And that's powerful instruction. Uh, Jesus lays that out. I mean, I love that. He basically says, you're not of the world anymore. You're not like them. You don't belong to them. You do not think like them because I chose you out of the world. I am all the difference in who you are now. Amen? Oh, Lord, thank you for your mercy. Not only is it a prohibitive command, there is, it's followed by a positive command. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. The, the root of this particular word is uh, metamorphosete, which we have an English word called metamorphosis, right? Be transformed means this is kind of what you were naturally. Be absolutely different than you were in your thinking, in your thoughts, in your ways. It, it, it carries this sense. Don't be you. Be like Christ. Wait a second. I thought the most important thing was to live as my authentic self. I, I thought the, the priority in the world is to look deep within and figure out my identity. And, and when, I, when, when I figure it out, you know, and it might be a new one no one else figured out before, but when I do, then, then I will be happy. I will never find happiness in this world until I somehow discover deep within me what I always was somehow meant in my own mind to be. The scripture commands begins with a simple word, repent. John the Baptist went around saying repent. Jesus came out saying repent. Repentance means you must have a change of mind. And the thoroughness is a change of mind that is so core and fundamental that it changes now not just your mind. It changes your thoughts. It changes your deeds. It changes your actions. Isn't that powerful? I mean, think about that. Such a, a, a rich... So be transformed. The same word, is, it, it's the same word that's used when Jesus went up to the mount and he was transfigured. Right? So they were used to seeing Jesus look a particular way. Pretty ordinarily human. 
And then all of a sudden, what happened? He is lifted up. He's bright and glorying and shining. And they're like, oh my, what is this? The word we use is transfigured, but it's the same word, transformed. Second Corinthians says this. Um, uh, 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 of who, those who are believers. It says in 2 Corinthians, this is uh, one of the few other places in the New Testament outside the Gospels where this verse, word is used. 2 Corinthians three seventeen and following. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled faces. The picture is the Israelites, when the law of Moses is read, when the scriptures are read, they have a veil that lies over their eyes, a veil that lies over their hearts. And it's read and they're unaffected, unchanged by it. But it says of us, we all with unveiled faces, when God's word is read, when God's word is proclaimed, it has a powerful difference. It says, we all with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. From one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is spirit. Second Corinthians, earlier in verse 14, it says this, their minds are hardened to this day because when they read the old covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because only in Christ is it taken away. And I think you and I need to understand that. To, to address those who are committed to the confusion of this age. It's not simply, this is right, no, this is right, no, this is right. And how's that going to have any effect? You know, is, is it the first person who flinches? The first person who bleeds. I mean, what is it? No, it's not this is right, this is right. It's you need Christ. You need to understand the gospel. You need to come to understand and see the world and to see sin through the death and resurrection of Christ. You understand that the wages of sin is death because in order to deal with sin, Jesus Christ died so that my sin would be forgiven. And you begin to understand, i got to look at the whole world and evaluate everything through Christ. Which is completely different. And how is it that they're being transformed? By the Word. What's interesting, when it says, uh, do not be conformed, it, it's stated there in the passive. Which kind of means what? If you do nothing, you will be conformed. If you are not intentionally, deliberately considering, thinking, testing, growing, praying in the Word, you are going to find yourself by default becoming like the world. And some of us will have, we'll see that in some of our own loved ones. You know, where uh, maybe because they're not hearing the word of God faithfully taught, maybe because they're not spending as much time in the scriptures as they ought to, those other voices are actually influencing. Well, how do, I, how do I rise above the influence? Don't think for a moment that all you can do is stick the fingies in the ear and not hear it. You know, maybe for some there is wisdom in turning off the news and, and, and these other things, but there are some who can listen to it and consider it with discernment and be driven to earnest prayer and, you know, and, and be moved to plead the gospel. To others in this lost and dying world. Oh, that there would be a metamorphosis. Well, how does this metamorphosis happen? Well, in Christ the veil is taken away. It says this in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, the old has passed away. All has become new. So, so here's what's important to note. 
if you're not a new creation, if the old is still all that you are, are you in Christ? Because in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, he is the new creation. If you're the same, do you know what that would mean? Okay, I haven't changed fundamentally how I think and how I live, but I don't want to go to hell, obviously. I mean, that, that doesn't make you saved. Well, uh, are there certain words that I could repeat that would magically save me? No! What must happen? And we all know what it says in the Gospel of John chapter 3, you must be born again. Cry out to God and say, God, I can't make myself a new creation. Make me new. I can't change me. You change my heart, oh God. You don't leave me to myself. I need you to do what I cannot do. Because even as a leopard cannot change his spots, so a person who is evil cannot change his way of doing and thinking. We need the grace of God to do that for us. Now, how does he do this? Let's see this process clarified briefly. Okay, Through the renewal of our minds, so be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Okay, so how is it that we renew our minds? Now, first thought that I want us to understand with this idea of renewal, uh, this word here for our minds is, is the word noose. It simply means this. Uh, one's understanding, their mind, their intellect, their reasoning, their insight, their awareness. It is, and I'm reading from uh, uh, the Freeburg Lexicon, the total inner orientation or moral attitude, a way of thinking, a mindset, a disposition. It affects our thoughts, judgment, resolve, and opinions. You need to be renewed basically totally <laughs> of all that your, your attitudes and your thoughts and your awareness and your reasoning and your perception, all of the former ways, g -g 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 garbage and now his ways. And it's not a surprise. Did not Paul say the same thing? He considered everything that he had loss compared to knowing Christ. Uh, our wisdom absolutely out the door. And again, this renewing of our mind, how does this process take place? Primarily through the Word of God. The Spirit does this work through the Word. Remember, it was with uh, the Word was read the Israelites still had the veil over their eyes. But we have that veil removed so that as we read, this is how Jesus says this in his high priestly prayer in John 17, verse 14 and following. He says, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. So what makes them so different than the world. We could list a lot of things, but the ultimate influence is the Word of God. It is through the Word that the Gospel of Jesus Christ has come to us. It is through the Word that we've understood what is right, what is wrong, what is true, what is false. All those things come to us through the Word. And what's shocking is, I think, Christians for too long have been able to live in a world where they were not hated by the world. <laughs> where they were somewhat indistinguishable in attitudes and opinions from the world. Here it says, I've given them your word and the world hated them because of it. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. I don't ask you to take them out of the world but keep them from the evil one. Jesus says this in verse 16 of John 17. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Verse 17, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. Brothers and sisters, we are not going to be able to fix ourselves. 
It isn't really going to come to sitting down and really thinking thoroughly of ourselves and evaluating this world. Even as we would evaluate ourselves and evaluate the world, world we must do so in light of the word because we don't want to lean on our own understandings. Our, otherwise, our opinions and our agendas will start to prevail. And it ought to have some effect because Ephesians 4, in talking about behavior, uh, Paul is uh, scolding the Ephesians for certain things they're doing by saying this in verse 20, that is not the way you learned Christ. Wait a second. So Christ is something to be learned? Yes! In a way that not only saves us, but changes the way we think and live? Yes! And then he goes on to say this in verse 21. Assuming you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. What a powerful transformation is to take place. Colossians 3.10 says, we have put on the new self, which is being renewed, present passive, in knowledge after its creator. So the renewal takes place passively as we are actively intaking the word. Okay? There are some who, who, who somehow think, you know what the answer is? Let go and let God. No, it's not. It's get into the word and prayer and you will find in those means God works powerfully within his people to transform us. Again, I, I look at some of these things. Hosea 4, 6 says this, as an indictment against the children of Israel, I fear it's a valid indictment today. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Hosea 4, 6. Because they have rejected knowledge, I reject you from being priests to me. Since you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. Whew, that's strong language, isn't it? Is it important to God that we always keep His word before us? Yes! And if we put it aside and other things slip in, even if we let them slip in under the peculiar title and terminology of love. Is it right? It is not. And this is a strong indictment. It says this also in Jeremiah 5, 30 and 31, which those doing the McShane's reading on the calendar schedule have read this week. It says this. An appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests rule at their own direction. And my people love to have it so. Wait a second. These guys are lying. These guys are telling you what they want. And the people love it. But the final sentence or phrase in that, in that verse says this. But what will you do when the end comes? Yeah, the person who loves to sing, I did it my way, you in trouble. You're in serious trouble. Because it affects the word, it affects how we worship. You know, our worship is not to come off like some kind of curious worldly event where you can't figure out, am I at a cafe? Am I at a, a, a party? Am I at a concert? I don't even know. Instead of, I'm at church. I'm where people with sincerity have assembled in the name of Jesus Christ to direct by grace their hearts and thoughts to Him, to worship Him in truth and spirit, to hear from Him through His word, to be further made like Christ. Amen? And we, and we see that it affects also all of our ways so that we're changed in what we do what we think all of these things are wonderfully transforming the fourth thing I draw your our attention to uh, uh, out of this chapter is he shows the purpose confirmed that by testing you may discern 
Now again, this testing is you learn what is true and what is false through the word, and so you run the tests. And I tell you, sometimes you've got to run a couple tests. I remember in my childhood, and I've shared this in the past, uh, working at a, a recycling center in the summers, you would ha- someone would bring in some metal to sell. And you would have to pay them, depending on what kind of metal it was, it had a different value per pound. And so there were certain things you do. You pull out a magnet, you throw the magnet on the thing. If it sticks, you know it's a ferrous metal. If it doesn't stick, it's non-ferrous. And so in your uncertainty, it didn't stick, so it's probably either aluminum or stainless steel. But these things also have different values. So I can't just, well, I'm going to pay you for this one. Then you get fired, right? So, what it, so you go, okay, next test. Let me take a little piece of it up to a grinder. Aluminum doesn't spark. Stainless steel does spark. An orange spark. Okay, I know what it is. And you, you've run that test. Some people, they run a first test from what they watch on TV. Uh, They put a verse on the bottom of the screen, so I think what he was saying must have been according to the Word of God. No! (laughs) That's just test one. (laughs) Is what he then says and explains about about that verse consistent with the whole counsel of the Word of God? Does he stick with the Word or does he share a verse and then share his thoughts? Do you hear a lot of and so I believe, you know, when I, when I think about this, I think, pfft, you know, thus says the Lord, God's word speaks and it has spoken and it is clear. And I, again, I don't want us to miss this. Uh, the person in terms of the testing is this Uh, that by testing you will discern what is the will of God. Not the opinion of the church, not my best intention, but what is the will of God. Do we get to weigh in on what the will of God is? Or does he tell us what the will of God is? We listen to God, and so it is about absolutely yielding ourselves to His Word. To no longer live my life in this world according to the desires of the flesh, but by the will of Him who gave Himself for me. And again, the particulars of this are that which is good and acceptable or well-pleasing and perfect. My opinions at times might verge on good, but what's acceptable to God, well-pleasing in His sight, and perfect, can't trust myself. At any point. I can't even say, well, I've been a Christian for this many years, so kind of whatever comes to my thought, that must be the right thing. There are some who have sadly drifted into a mildly mystical bent where every thought they have in the moment Ah, the Spirit is telling me this is okay. The Word is given by the Spirit. So if your momentary sense of some sort of Spirit prompting is at difference from the clearly established Word of God, then you be aware of the warning in 1 John, not every spirit that's gone out is from the Lord. And you may be just your own desires within you welling up. Because we are there, the passions of the flesh wage war against our souls. So don't think for a moment, well, it came from deep within me, so it must be good. Not exactly how it works. So, just in, in, in conclusion, this passage gives us a prohibitive command. What is that prohibitive command? Do not be conformed to this world in any way. The positive command, but be transformed. The process, by the renewal of your minds through the word and it affects our worship and it affects our way of living and with the purpose confirmed so that by testing you may discern what is the will of God so it's all about him his word his way his will where's my place you get to be the servant of the great and holy 
and only God. That's our place. The creature, to honor the creator and to seek to do so according to the particulars. And I know that I will fall short and you will fall short in the process of this life. But thanks be to God that we've got a mediator in Christ who allows our flawed praise and our flawed struggles to be acceptable through him and that God would look upon us. Uh, It it still blows my mind when the scriptures say of of that day when some stand before God in judgment that he will say to some, well done. Because I think, oh, that's only through mercy and forgiveness and looking through Christ. Because, not really. But oh, thank you for your mercy. And if there is any boast, let all the glory be to God through his grace given me in Christ Jesus. If I have done anything aright, it is because I have yielded my way and listened to the word, and I've only done so by his grace opening my heart and mind. Let's pray. Oh God, your word is so great and so powerful, so important, and we, your people, all need to be radically reformed at the very core and fundamental person of who we are when we enter this world we need to be changed we need to be made a new creation in Christ Jesus that change is to be a change for the better a change not wrought by our efforts or energies or decisions but a change wrought by the very power of God through the spirit by the word oh God we are so thankful for the privilege we have to draw near to you that even now when we uh come in prayer and we come in song that because of Christ we have boldness to draw near and you have promised when we draw near to you you draw near to us thank you God for your mercy continue oh God your work of weaning us from the world give us a readiness for being in a world that hates us let us glory in the fact that they hated you before us And so it is in your name that we want to live. In your name, we want to eat and drink and do everything. And it is in your name that we pray. Amen.